police comet and that kind of stuff. So I grew up with uh, an awful lot of old tech. Now, what I'll talk about today is basically getting this one working as well if it lets me. Yeah. Uh, this is Frank Drake. And the equation you can see on the board is basically Drake's equation. I wouldn't call it an equation. It's more of a formula. It's more of a something to discuss. There are a number of elements. We're going through them all, which we've got figures for and facts and lots of data. And then the rest of it is what you want to make up for it, including what I suggest. So just moving on. So good. So. That is formula in full. We're going to look at each one of them in turn anyway, so we don't need to particularly stop at this point. But the key element is that one. That's on the left. Number of technologically advanced civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, that's our galaxy, not the other ones. And that can easily be extended to any galaxy, pretty much. So we're going to try and come up with, by the end of today's discussion, a possible number just for our galaxy. Okay, so there's quite a few bits of information for us to look at. Obviously, there are many galaxies out there, and I thought we'd start with the obvious thing. Well, the probability of life is quite simple. It's one. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go on now. We've done. Uh, no, basically, that's just in our Milky Way. And there's the important bit. And it works. Is it being slow today? Not working now, boss. Yeah, yeah there you go. 200 billion galaxies. I've heard a few astronomers saying it's in trillion, which is just 10 times bigger you realize that 10 times bigger doesn't make an awful lot of difference with a lot of the numbers we're going to talk about today. And we get that number from Hubble. Hubble took its deep space photo, whatever, 15, 20 years ago, and we counted all the galaxies in that small patch of sky, which is probably smaller than your little fingernail in the sky, and it counted many hundreds, if not thousands of galaxies in that one little picture. And if you take that across the whole sky, they came up with that number, which I trust at the moment. Um, so we could have put Really is, to be honest. And this is basically where it does it. These are stellar nurseries. Uh, most of us probably recognize that constellation, even though we're not astronomers. In the middle of winter, look out night, that's Orion. Both of these are in Orion. Let's just see if I can, I don't think this will work on these. No, basically, this red blob here is that, and that's called the Orion Nebula. It's probably the most famous one in the sky, far one. And near this bottom star of the three belt stars is that one, and that bright star right in the middle of the picture is that bright star. Um, this dollar nurseries. Our sun roughly went through that same patch of space several million years ago. So this, this is where stars are continually being made in space through clouds of dust and generally they form as we go along. So you could see that orange one there with the naked eye. Well, I don't mind if you ask questions. Yeah, talk about the, the, the figure that made it amazing. Has the data as a galaxy aging? Does it start increasing, decreasing? Or, I mean, what happens to this figure in space? 
it should stay relatively constant for most of the life of a normal galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy. Uh, spherical galaxies or they're, they're special cases of galaxies that have usually gobbled up lots of smaller galaxies and lost their spiral shape and they no longer form any stars. They've got the stars they've got and they'll die like that. That's it. That's how it goes. But our galaxy for the next probably at least 10, 15 billion years will form stars. Okay. A good question, to be honest. Okay, now there's some of the important figures. Don't worry about most of the figures on there. But the most important thing is our sun's in that column. And when you look up in the sky, about three and a half percent of the stars are like, like our sun. Okay, not that many. So roughly three and a half stars out of every hundred you look up is a bit like our sun. That's quite an important thing to bear in mind for this talk. All of these stars to the left. Okay, even less, much less, and barely ever exist. So you look up, you hardly ever see one of them. You'll see some uh, B stars and A stars up in Orion, because uh, one of the brightest stars up there is a B star. Now, these numbers at the very top are the temperatures of the surface of the star. Our sun's about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, which is degrees centigrade to you lot, because it doesn't make a lot of difference for 273. Um, so the idea is about 6,000 degrees at the surface of our sun. And you've got to bear that in mind for all of these stars. These stars are cooler. Okay, it's important when we look at the next set of slides. But look how common these stars get, especially this one here. Okay, 80% of all stars, if you could see them, would be M stars. And you can see some of them, but not as many as you think. So when we start to look through that, it's very important to bear in mind that as you go to the right, they get cooler on the surface, and as you go to the right, they're far more common. Very important concept in the probabilities that we're working on. Pretty, pretty much on a simple level, yeah. It's more about mass, okay? It's more about that middle column. The lower the mass, the longer they live. Our sun is mass one, because we use it as a definition, and it'll live for about normally 10 billion years, 15 in total. And then it goes on beyond that, to be honest, and we'll discuss that shortly as well. So, oh, that did something funny there. <laughs> Still doing some funny things at the top there. It's locked on, boss. Yeah, there we go. So, stars. As we were just discussing, they all live and die. Most of these are about dying stars or dead stars, pretty much. So when our sun dies, it will become one of these a white dwarf because it's not big enough. It will not go supernova. It will just kind of blow a smoke ring. And we'll see that in a minute. That, <laughs> sorry, that's the smoke ring nebula. Uh, and it'll just collapse on itself and form a white dwarf. And it'll live for maybe another 20, 30, 40 billion years at that stage. Okay, but that stage, you know, its surface temperature is now 80,000. Wow, okay. Okay, but that'll cool down over time, of course. And that'll change, obviously, before that's happened. This smoke ring, well, if the Earth was on that scale, it'd be inside the green bit. That smoke ring's gone well below, beyond the edge. Okay, so we all have been in the middle of this, call it a minor explosion. It's, it's a puff out. It just gets bigger and bigger because our sun becomes one of these. And basically, before it turns into one of them, it'll roughly stretch out to Mars. So the surface layers out at Mars, so we're inside it. Good night, Earth. We're not here anymore. I don't care who's on Earth then. Unless they've got the best biodomes in the history of the universe, they ain't surviving. The planet will, the rock will, it won't get that hot, it'll just be inside a dying star. Okay? So, and super giant stars are those stars that don't live very long. Okay, our sun will just become a giant. Our sun's designation today is a yellow dwarf, and it's 850,000 miles across. So it starts to give you an idea of what you've got to get to in size to become a giant. And again, back to Orion, because top left over the last few years, 
that's a Beetlejuice type funny way. Beetlegers, if you Patrick Moore, stop people saying Beetlejuice. That was the one that was uh, brightening and dimming and brightening, and everybody got a bit confused and thought it was going to go supernova. Uh, when that does go supernova, you'll see it for about three weeks in the middle of the day. Be nearly as bright as the moon, maybe. It's not that far away. It's only a couple of thousand light years away on the scale of what we talk. That's kind of next door neighbours. And then this one down here is one of them really quick live stars, Rigel. Okay, it's... It's already a super giant and it's in its normal life. Okay, and we'll discuss that more in just a few moments. And its surface temperature is therefore a lot hotter than our sun. So, all of these stars out there, some of them are cooler than our sun, they're the more popular ones. Some of them are hotter than our sun, they're actually not that common. But we've got to bear in mind how many different stars there are out there and what they can do for us or against us. This is basically the birth chart of a star. Anyone who's into horology, sorry, that's that the time. Okay, I don't say that with a word, but I can help it. There's a big path you can see there called the main sequence, and it does a big S. That's where stars live when they're in their normal first phase of life. That's where our sun is right now. It's pretty much under the W of dwarfs. Okay, because our sun is roughly in the middle. This it just happens to be in the middle. We didn't do it that way, it just happens to sit in the middle. And other stars have basically, they can start off as giant stars or super giant stars, they're normal life pretty much. And they're the ones that live up, they're the top left of that main sequence. Now, when big stars decide to die, we're probably well aware, they all go supernova. If it's about uh, one and a half times the size of the sun, it becomes a supernova. And that's the core, not the star. Okay, you probably need a star of about four or five times the mass of the sun. When it blows off all its outer layers, it's still got that one and a half, two masses left to become a supernova. So stars basically, fall, all stars fall on that map. And look at where brown dwarves are right down the bottom. They're not very bright stars because uh, their temperature is quite low. And this is basically the formation of a star, our sun's light. It started way over on the right, outside the room somewhere. There's a cloud of hydrogen, a bit of helium. And I followed that path from one to two. That would have maybe took 10 million years. So this big cloud of dust that we saw in that nursery photograph collapsed around the sun, maybe 10 million years, and then the star became a star at number two. So that's our sun now. Okay, and what you need to realize is that it doesn't just quite stay there. I wish it did, because we'd have a lot less problems. Number two, it's actually slowly moving up that curve. Very slowly. You barely notice it. It'd probably still be inside the number two. But the difference that makes is that over the next three billion years, our sun gets 40% brighter. Okay. We think we've got problems now. If we don't plan long enough in the group, yeah, you know what I mean? It's, it's going to hit us anyway, whether we like it or not. Then our sun boringly becomes a giant. Okay? And it goes up to that number three spot. This is where it says to itself, God, what do I do next? That's when it basically puts off a smoke ring. And that was that picture we saw earlier of the ring nebula. It'll just send that out into outer space reasonably high speeds. It'll basically then get brighter and hotter because the smoke ring actually shows the star underneath. So it comes out of that a bit brighter and hotter and ends up all the way over there, up in the top left. And then it comes down to number four, slowly over time, is a white dwarf. Okay, so this white dwarf lights up the nebulosity around it. It's actually quite warm for a while. And then it goes down to White Dwarf, which is exceptionally hot, 80,000 degrees. So we ain't there then. We've already gone. Okay? And that will happen in approximately four to five billion years, which is the least of our problems anyway. Uh, so what I want to look at now is the next point. Fraction of those stars with planetary systems. Well, I'm not a young guy. I used to watch Patrick Moore in the 70s and 80s a lot. 
And this was the first early discovery I ever remember being mentioned. It's called Barnard Strike. I'll see it at the top. They lost that title for me. Um, I only chose this photo because it shows the effect that I want to see. The dates are, are wrong on it. In the 60s, some guy basically took a series of photographs like that. Because this star is very close to us. And usually, it moves like a rocket through space. It really is. In about 10 years, it'll move about, the, uh, 100 years, sorry, it moves about the distance what we see the moon. In we can look at it and watch it move over time. It's a fast-moving star. It'll actually be in about, I think, 10 million years, the closest star to us. Now, what this guy discovered is he took a series of photos like that. And if you look at it, the star's just traveled through space. It should travel roughly, we'll say in a straight line over the short term. It does not travel in the curve, but it's irrelevant for this because we look at that picture and that third one down definitely looks like it's jumped to the left. And that's what he took a picture of. And he took a load more pictures. And what he thought that was, was a planet and a star doing the tango. Is the only way I can put it in simple terms. They spin around each other. And as they pull on each other, the star gets pulled to the side. Okay? Because this is one of them M-type stars. So it's not a particularly big star or anything. And it's got a planet around it, they reckon, probably bigger than Jupiter. And this star tugs on that star. And over the course of its orbit, when the planet's on this side, the star's getting tugged that way. When the planet's on this side, the star's getting tugged that way. And it kind of winds, it does a little helical path through space. So he thought that's what he found. Sadly, he was sadly mistaken because his camera, he changed his camera over several years. And it was purely down to his optics, being different optics. So what he discovered wasn't true, but it was a very important uh, first leap into we think we've discovered a planet, because that was uh, one of those first ones that I remember seeing. The first one after that, or around that same time, I think, was this one. This is Beta Pictoris, fairly close star to us. And the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope in the 70s took that picture. And on the scale of everything, the star's right in the middle, and the Earth's orbit would be just around that white dot or something of that nature. It wouldn't be that far away, so it's quite a big scale. That's there just to hide the star, otherwise the star just blinds out the picture. So it's got a, a little mask on it, just shows you what's outside the star. And that's a planetary disk. And that was the first ever direct evidence that there was something that could form planets outside of our solar system. And that one always intrigued me a lot because it's definitely photographic direct evidence, not just physics. Go on to that in just a moment. Um, not too much, I hope. So we can see the idea that we took a picture of our solar system three, four, three years ago, there's lots of dust in that of the planet still. And if you took that picture, we'd look like that. So this is a young star. Still with lots of its dust in place. Because if you look at Jupiter and Saturn and that now and then bigger planets, they took all the dust away. Certainly within their orbits. There's very little dust left now. So that was the first evidence that we looked at. Now, I wonder how many of you have heard of the Goldilocks zone. It's really simple. If you're too close to something that's hot, you're too hot. If you're too far away from something that's too that hot, you're too cold. That's what the little snow thing symbolizes. And if you're in that green zone, you're possibly up at my temperature. And what we determine that is, can we have liquid water? Because it's one of the, we call it a prerequisite of life. I'm not totally convinced of that, but you've got to have sometimes water, at least. If there isn't water sometimes, I don't really see life forming. So if you look at these three different stars, so like we said, this A star it probably only lives 200 million years. Bear that in mind of how long we've been here. Or two hours. Um, 
The Goldilocks zone's quite far out. But you only get 200 million years to form life before that you know, good night Vienna, you're, you're a supernova remnant. The middle one, our sun, okay, it's closer in because it's the coolest star. Oh, yeah, okay. So we're, we're actually no longer um, perfectly in the middle of the Goldilocks zone. We were many, many, many years ago. We're now near the inside of it. Mars is actually coming onto the edge of that. Because our sun, as I said before, if anyone remembers, is slowly getting lighter. So that Goldilocks zone travels outwards from most stars a little bit over time. Probably stays roughly the same width, but it goes outwards. And then M stars, well, look, that's probably a terrible scale because that should be even closer to the star, that green band. Should almost be next door. Um, because one of the effects that we have is that. I uh, don't know how many of you have seen the sun in the last few months or few years. Uh, certainly up until about two years ago, the sun was doing nothing for about three or four years. It's a bit unusual. Very, very, very relaxed the sun was. I actually looked at it through a solar scope a couple of weeks ago. I saw something not far off like that on the side of the disk. And they're basically coronal, I just want to check what the next slide is here, coronal, coronal mass ejections. Uh, in 1869, I think it was, two British astronomers just happened to be looking at the sun at the same time. It's not on the edge of the sun they saw this thing, but more or less right in the middle of it, they saw a massive flash of light, which you don't normally see on the sun. Okay, it flashed. And they knew a little bit that this flash of light was actually going to head towards the Earth. Okay, because it's in the middle of the sun and we're going in an orbit around it. What it was doing was shooting off material slightly ahead of us. And we were about in the next 24 hours about to go through where that was going to end up. And that thing went three times faster than normal because it normally takes two or three days to get here. It took 17 hours. So the energy within this thing was far superior to what we normally get. And that's called a Carrington event. And you could see aurora in the tropics. Okay, if we had satellites up then, every one of them would have been fried to death. Okay, that, and that's the kind of event that they say only occurs every couple of hundred years, but we had one about 10 years ago, apparently, but it didn't quite uh, hit us full on. But we have these events quite regularly. Now imagine if you were close to a star. The chances of getting hit by one of them, much higher. Like a dark ball, probably closer, I'll hit the target. Okay? So this thing is dangerous to anything alive. Okay, so you're now saying, well, okay, these eight stars, they don't live, live long enough. Our lovely G star, okay? It seems to have survived this. I don't think our Earth moved a great deal in and out of its orbit in the last four billion years. But any planet that gets hit by one of them direct, especially a bigger one of them, or more regularly, you're just basically saying, let's strip the ozone. Let's radiate you. Let's kill you on the spot, not let anything live. So this is a very negative aspect of all stars. We are very, very lucky. <laughs> so many things that have to happen for the Earth. Not only to still be here, but to be in the right place at the right time. The main part is this. Um, it's slightly out of date for the numbers because I can't find a better picture that does that. You can roughly double all them numbers. We find a lot more of these planets. Kind of makes sense. They're huge. Jupiter's 10 times bigger than the Earth. You can fit a thousand Earths inside Jupiter, kind of thing. And then as you go down, there's slightly less of them. But a nice number there. As I said, you could probably double these. Over a thousand Earths we've discovered. Or some say Earth-like planets. Not in the Goldilocks zone. Not those yet. Just the size of it and the style. We reckon it's a rocky planet. We don't know if it's got an atmosphere. Although there are later things I'll discuss maybe about that. 
we have discovered an atmosphere around our planets like that now. We now have that technology and that ability. We've discovered carbon dioxide atmospheres, uh, methane atmospheres around rocky planets. They're nearly always methane, the big ones. Because Jupiter's just one great big methane bowl with some diamonds in the middle. You can try and get them if you want, but you'll be crushed. So there's the general idea of, of the ratio, of the number of planets we are currently discovering, really, really. And we're even discovering Mercury-sized ones. Uh, I don't know if it's on this slide or if it's on the next one. Uh, I won't be having them. Stop with it. We discovered the first one in 1992. It was unusual in that this small set of planets was orbiting a pulsar. A pulsar is basically the best clock in the universe. We can time them to more accuracy than we can measure. So when a pulsar gets tugged backwards and forwards by its planets, it comes closer to us and further away. And the Doppler shift applies to the light. So that's when it changes uh, its frequency. Basically, we slow it down and speed it up. And we can read that clock like a sine wave and go, wow, there's a planet. It's about this big. It's sitting at this distance from the star. So the first three were discovered 2,000 light years away, which is quite a long way away in this scheme. Um, and they're all quite small. But because of that timing effect of the pulsar, somebody was looking at pulsars and saw this data and went, wow, what's that doing? And they worked it out. The first were discovered around the pulsar a long way away from us. Um, quite important in terms of light because most of the planets are categorized. Are they hot Jupiters, cold gas giants, ocean worlds and ice giants? That sounds like us, it isn't. Lava worlds, you can guess why. Rocky planets, that's us. We're actually near the edge of it, I think, over there somewhere, believe it or not. And then Frontier, I'm not even sure what that one quite means. I think they haven't quite defined it yet. We can categorize all these planets. You can start to think about where do you think we would discover life. I mean, in some next, ocean wells don't sound impossible, but rocky planets we know because here we are. Okay, it gives uh, a surface for mammalian kind of style life, which is possibly an important consideration in terms of some of the later features we look at. So we need to know what we're looking at. Oops, hold on. No, I'm going forwards. See, I'm not used to this control. Uh, let's go with that one. Now, the first one I discovered, first outside of that other one I talked about, was well, the one, well, no one, it wasn't the first. It's called Trappist One. And this one star has those seven planets around it, possibly another couple on top of that, but it has those seven. I don't know of anyone except that the front can read the main top line, which is they range from one and a half days orbit to 20 days orbit. Okay, there is something I'll say. This is an M type star. But being, believe it or not, being inside there is not a problem. But there are other problems associated with that. But they're all roughly, very roughly, the size of the Earth and the mass of the Earth. And then just breaking those figures down. So you can see them a little bit more, say one and a half out to six days, and then nine days out to 20. I'm showing you that they're all kind of similar size of the Earth. They're not massively dissimilar in terms of their mass. Okay, If they're a little bit bigger than the Earth and a little bit more massive, that makes sense. They're probably similar densities of the Earth. Maybe an important consideration, but not massive. Now, really nice, simple thing to look at. Here, it sits in the middle. And basically, we're looking at where do these planets sit relative to the Earth? And quite simply, C, D, and E look like they could actually, well, certainly D and E look like they could be in the right place. Because the Goldilocks zone for this star is in the order of a few days orbit, rather than 365 because it's so much cooler. 
but there are side effects to that. So planet's density. So these planets are slightly lower density than the Earth. The Venus is called our sister planet. The only difference between that is basically it gets more illumination from the sun by a factor of about two and a half, two. So it gets twice as much light as we do. That's not the reason it's the hottest planet in the solar system. Uh, that reason is down to one simple fact, it's a big greenhouse. It's carbon dioxide atmosphere, pretty much purely, takes all the heat in, lets none of it out, and it's a lovely place to go on holiday. Be a very hot holiday. So now, now look at it in terms of the golden oxygen. What you've got to get in context here is the top one is Trappist in the big scale. And the bottom one is our solar system with the Trappist right nowhere, right next to the star. You've got to crunch that right down. So you know, Mercury's fairly close to the sun. Makes it look like it's miles away compared to the outside one of Trappist. So Trappist is like... You would think it's nearly orbiting the disk of the sun. So ridiculous. And what we now start saying is the number of planets per solar system. Uh, you will normally orbit one star. You won't do a big figure of eight. Be the nearest star will probably uh, be the one that determines your weather patterns, and the further star will affect that on a seasonal basis. It'll drag you out, and it'll drag you in. Yes, so these animals have got to live in a far more diverse habitat, which we'll discuss a bit later on. So, realizing that these Trappist planets are basically right next to their star. My God, I couldn't get closer if they tried on that scale. But that has an effect. Uh, most of us know when we look at the moon, we always see the same face. We don't see the backside of the moon. It's called timely lock. And any moon going around a planet or any planet going around a star often suffers from the same, call it problem, when they're close. So what we just saw with Trappist, this illustrates that most of the Trappist planets are tidally locked. That means they show that same face to that star all day and all night. There's no such thing as day and night, because it's day and night. Okay? If you live on the far side of that star, you are freezing yourself to death. And if you live on the near side of that star, you're boiling yourself to death. Not really, because when planets do this trick, they tend to become a snowball planet. Because on the back side of that planet, all water moisture goes out to the back, freezes and falls on the ground. And that tends to edge its way around to the front of the planet slowly over time. Because ice reflects. And, and you end up with a fully snow-covered planet. So not particularly great options. And that's one of the main reasons why M stars are terrible options for life. So you're not likely to see an M star with a life-bearing planet going around it. Um, a couple of ones that we've looked at, Tau Ceti is very much like our sun. It's also a game I used to play in the 80s. 12 light years away, but it's pretty much next door neighbor, truly next door neighbor. And the Goldilocks zone in it is a super Earth. So when we look at this, E and F of those planets are in the Goldilocks zone. And that's one of the top 10 nearest stars to us. Obviously, I would suggest that E, if it hasn't already formed life, never will, because that Goldilocks zone is going to slowly move out. Okay, all stars do that, because this is a very young star. And F will probably sit in the middle of the Goldilocks zone in a couple of tens of millions of years because the star will naturally brighten over time, over its life. And that's what all stars do. So F looks like a candidate in the future. It could be forming life as we speak. So a good candidate. Uh, yeah, this is showing the main 
way in which we discovered that that was the tango I was talking about earlier. So the blue thing's a star, the black thing's a planet, and that's the actual orbit they follow. It's slightly exaggerated, but it follows that. And the idea is that the star doesn't just rotate on it and, and goes around. That never happens. Our sun doesn't even do that. Okay, our sun gets tugged by Jupiter, which is moderately big for a planet. And our sun does something not quite as drastic as that, but it does that. So somebody looking at our sun will see the same effect. Now, that was the first way in which planets were discovered around that pulsar. This method here is basically called the eclipse method. There's 200 billion stars out there. The chances are that a couple of million of them, as we look at them, the disk is edge on to us, more or less. And when we look at them, the planets occasionally go right in front of the star and go round the back of it, right in front of the star. And they'll do that for thousands of years, not millions. And that's our main discovery method. That was the way in which we discovered most of the planets on the earlier one, because we sent up a probe to do specifically that. So we look for that little light dip, and if we sit, oh, it's every, if it's every 100 days, wow, this thing's got a 100-day orbit. And then once we start knowing that, we can start working out roughly how dense it is or how massive it is because of relatively simple physics. So we can do an awful lot with just this left-hand method. That one tells us very quickly how massive they are. Okay? And this one can tell us more about the atmospheres. Because this fella, probably the most unsung probe ever sent out, probably one of the most productive, Kepler, was sent out just to go out and discover air-type planets around stars. Only John. It was out there for 9.6 years. And basically, it's discovered nearly part of every single planet out there that we've discovered so far. Um, but most of them were bigger planets. But its primary job was to try and discover Earths. So you start to look at this, and when it says it only sends us back 678 gigabytes, uh, the modern telescopes of today will probably do about a terabyte a day. It's one of the biggest telescopes that we get out on, on Earth today. We're trying to work with a terabyte per day output of information. The world's moving on. This wasn't that long ago, to be honest. So very, very important. And notice where its orbit was. It wasn't around here. Bit like, it's a bit like uh, JWST, James Webb, anyone who knows it. It's been sent out to a special point where it can follow the air all the time. Okay, because the air's going around and it follows the air. Fraction of suitable planets on which life actually appears. Okay, I picked this bell. I've taught a lot of science over the years. Um, it does not look like that pink thing. That's, that's a real picture. <laughs> they always show that. And I go, God, I wish he looked like that. It looks cuddly like a teddy bear. But that's just like an amoeba. And that's all he is. He's a multi celled animal. Basically, these are the kind of things we took out into space on the space shuttle. Stuck them out in space, brought them back in. Give them a drop of water and they're still alive. These things can live for 30 years without water, but they only live for about three months. Wow, so they can spend most of their lives in hibernation. I think some of us need to learn that trick to last long enough. So, this thing will do 151 degrees C for a very short time, of course. It's not, not its natural habitat, and then minus 196. I'm not even sure we've ever had that on Earth unless we generated it. So these animals are some of the most adaptable little creatures I've ever come across in my teaching career. They'll pretty much live anywhere, doing anything for any length of time, sitting there waiting for a nicer day. And that's kind of you know suitable, which appears. I'm just suggesting here, it doesn't take a fantastically great planet to start generating life. You don't have to start with a perfect planet. Our planet had a lot of carbon dioxide at the beginning, before the prehistoric times. And then plant life came along and absorbed a lot of the carbon dioxide. So 
Animals come in to fill a niche, and then other animals like us, the oxygen breathers, came in later. Because once the plants start giving us enough oxygen, we start to get bigger. And once we got to where we are, we got to where we are, which is uh, one of the more intelligent species, I say. The main reason I put this slide on is the diverse environments all these animals on Earth can live on. We get them living on ice sheets. But the most important one on that picture, in my opinion, is this one. It's called deep sea hydrothermal vents. Because anyone who knows of the mission that probably went out just a few months ago, or juiced, it's going to one of Jupiter's moons to basically see if it's got an ocean underneath its ice layer, which we pretty much believe it has, and look for the idea that it probably has got something like this as the moons of Jupiter keep on getting squashed, let go, and squashed, and let go. And that effect of squeezing is a bit like using a, a foot pump on your bike. It heats things up. Okay? Underneath the surface of those moons, it might be quite warm. Warm enough for normal water in liquid form, not ice. And then obviously some of the obvious ones, like in ice lakes, uh, in acid lakes, and then uh, soda nuclear contaminated sites. We find things that live in these things. So we shouldn't really limit the environment too much. It's more whether an animal can sustain an environment and then change the environment so that other animals can live in the environment or plants. So it's very, very diverse on Earth. Why? It probably starts off quite diverse, as in niche, and gets diverse very quickly. Because animals, a bit like that. Fraction of life bearing planets on which intelligent life emerges. Okay, I, I basically tried to identify the only two intelligent species on Earth. Um, dolphins are pretty much considered as intelligent as we are, but you still don't see. Monkeys are only 4% difference to us in DNA. I think it's four, might be two, but something silly like that. And some of them are pretty bright creatures, what they do. The bonobo monkeys are quite famous for being very inventive. Even the crow, the bird, very inventive animals out there. But they're not what we're describing as intelligent. Sadly, it's us. We're only as intelligent as we appear to be in act. So uh, I think going back to the previous slide, if life starts somewhere, that's where it's got to head. It's got the choice. If, it, if it's given long enough, it heads in that direction. And most biologists are generally in agreement with that, that once life forms, it should naturally proliferate and attempt to become more intelligent. Um, fractions of civilizations that develop a technology that releases detectable signs of their existence into space. Well, we've been doing it for about 100 years. Still don't think we're very intelligent, but we've been doing it for about 100 years. And this was a signal, I can't remember the year without me notice, but I think it was 1977. And some guy was just listening to space with a radio telescope, and it's normally should be ones, two, threes, with the occasional blip at four and five, and he got J-U-Q-E in the middle there. Okay. And he, for obvious reasons, he actually wrote that when it came out the printer. Wow. Okay. And it's called the wow signal for that reason. And it was discovered by that particular telescope up there, which is a radio telescope. Uh, the problem with that is only about 10 years ago, so we proved it's not a wow signal. It was actually a rogue comet. Okay. Basically, they had a couple of comets sitting in Sagittarius when that was looking at Sagittarius. And then a few years ago, those that comet came back to Sagittarius or wherever it was, and they took another radio picture of it. And it kind of gave more or less the same sort of signal. So sadly, it is not a wow signal from a fantastically advanced civilization. But that's kind of how we expect to receive it. A bit more technological today, but that's how we expect to receive it. Length of time so civilizations release, release detectable signals into space. Um, you've got to realize we started off with radio a little bit over 100 years ago. We're now into more TV than radio. 
in the future, we'll be just on web wires. We won't be sending much out there anymore. So let's, let's say 200 years, if I'm being a bit pessimistic, we won't send much out that way at all. It'll all be along wires. So we might only send signals out for 200 years. Wow, on the cosmic scale, that's like a millisecond. It's just nothing. And it's another part of the discussion that we go on to. Is there anybody out there? <laughs> I hope so. The one thing I wanted to discuss because it leads back to that last one, is the Fermi paradox. It says, you can read it, this is the Fermi paradox refers to the dichotomy between high probability that extraterrestrial intelligence exists and the fact that we have no evidence of such aliens. Who are they kidding? I've just told you aliens might only send signals out for 200 years that we can detect. That means we have to be listening to them in that small 200 year spell. Uh, 10, 100, 1,000, a million civilizations may have actually lived and died before today. We're just the one right now around this area of our galaxy that's alive right now. Wow. I call it the overlap. If we don't overlap another reasonably close civilization, we'll never detect them. If we're not listening, like with SETI, I don't know if anyone ever used to run it on their computer in the 80s and the 90s. It used to have uh, the radio dish at Arecibo and occasionally Jodhpur Bank. It would listen to the sky as well as take pictures for the astronomer. And it would take that signal, send it to our computers. We would analyze it for alien signals. So it was one of the biggest collectives of uh, search for SETI extraterrestrial life that we've ever done. So one of the big things here on that particular slide is just basically saying, wow, if you think we can hear another civilization that they just happen to be here at the same time as us and we're listening. I'd be amazed. Be the biggest royal flush in the history of poker. Okay, it's very unlikely because of the time scales. Our sun's been here for four billion years, five billion years. Our galaxy's been here for 13 and a half billion years. The universe has been here just a bit longer than that. As I've said, if, if that happened in the first five billion years, wow, imagine that that particular race of people has had an extra nearly 10 billion years to evolve. Where are they? We're not going to see them. We're not going to have spacecraft coming down here and crash landing because they're too stupid to fly around here. So if you can fly from one star to the Earth, there's no way on Earth you're going to crash on it. You've got to be the stupidest alien in the history of aliens. So I do not believe in most of these things being aliens, if any of them, to be honest. But I do believe in that. In that if we add all our numbers up together, any conclusions that not zero means we have life somewhere. And one of the big things that was this was 12 people. Uh, Mr. Drake, Frank Drake was one of them. Carl Sagan was another. In the same meeting, the guy who discovered photosynthesis was given his Nobel Prize in the meeting. So this is the kind of meeting I'm talking about. This was about 1970-odd. They came up with a solution to that equation. I think they overestimated it, not drastically stupidly, but they came up with 10,000 just in our galaxy. I tend to believe them more than me because I think they know more than I do. But I think it could easily be in the tens and the hundreds. They're just factors of a hundred and a factor of ten away. I'm on the same ballpark as far as I'm concerned. And that's just in our galaxy. They were not trying to say in the universe. So times uh, 10,000 by 200 billion. I'm, I've got a maths degree, but I'm not doing that. Um, the idea is that's what they think might be in the universe. So that's the end for now, until we discover more. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. I've got no reason to go home. It's almost beautiful.
If I give them more space, I'm more proactive. Any real questions? Yeah, I think 10,000 based on their figures because they knew less than we did now. No, no, because this was just a meeting between them and all they came, all I've ever found out. It was actually on, it's on the BBC, it's on iPlayer, and it's a talk about Frank Drake. And he mentioned that meeting. I went, okay, that's that applies to what I'm talking about. So I thought I'd mention it. So it just so happened that you've got the Drake equation on the BBC iPlayer. I did try and look up the meeting, but I couldn't find much about it. <laughs> Any more? Thank you. Um, so the solution you propose with urban area is that yep. uh, we don't emit things for very long. Correct. Um, does that mean that you think that it's unlikely we ever leave this planet? Obviously, if we're going to communicate between planets, that's not going to be wired, right? That's going to be wireless. Um, so, um, yeah, I was just wondering what you think about like the possibility of like. To the stars at the moment, you would have to use effectively some kind of laser technology, it, and it would be even better than the ones we currently got. Because if you fire a laser from Earth, by the time it gets to the moon, instead of it being you know one millimeter across, it's one meter across or ten meters across. So this this so-called laser light doesn't stay at one millimeter; it does travel and beam out like light does. So we have to find another way to communicate with them, and that's the hard bit. But I don't think we will communicate in the fashion of let's send a radio signal. It will be we might receive a signal, and hopefully by that time we've got rocket technology. That means we can just set off, take a hundred years and get there. It's easier to talk to people than it is to send a message that takes a hundred years to get a reply. It's just unrealistic. It's a bit like you know the man on the moon. It was two seconds delay. Okay, you go to Mars. It's an hour's delay. You go to Pluto, it's like half a day's delay. You realize the further you go out, hello, and you're going to wait for like, you know, 12 hours to hear the hello back. It, it's not a great way to communicate. What you do is you send a library to them. And they can interpret our library of information. And hopefully they will then send the library back. And that, that would be probably the most efficient and sensible form of communication for Adjoining civilizations. So on that note, then, um, if so, we're a planet. Um, we're emitting CVs in the last hundred years, but only at a certain strength. So, um, how far out could it be feasibly detected before it's that small? It depends on the size of your receptor. Uh, anyone who remembers a picture of Arecibo. This was basically a massive dish. I think it was 500 meters across, built into a natural valley. Okay, there's one in China now that makes that look like a tea, little tea thing. It's about a thousand and a half meters across or something stupid. And they built that. The bigger your receiver, the weaker the signal you can pick up and differentiate it from the background. In theory, we could start making receivers the size of our solar system by using a technique called interferometry. Yeah. So we can easily go to the size of our universe quite easily with a couple of space probes. Okay, so you just right technology can stuff from any planet. Yeah. So therefore, that why, why we haven't listened to it, heard it yet, because we haven't yet got the technology to get out there. It's either we haven't got the technology or no signals being sent at the time we've been listening. They might have been sent a thousand years ago, too early for us. Ah, but since we put that up, we can listen to it. 
Oh. Yeah, well, well, when I say the past, I know what you mean by that. But the idea is, if they send their signal out and it's gone past us, that's yeah, it. We yeah, we've missed them. So unless you're going to sit there and direct our star, like we have occasionally using the SETI project, we picked a couple, like the 20 closest stars, and we've sent signals directly to them, as powerfully as we can, in the hope that they can hear it. No, they're still sending out signals, because we probably still send them signals out every now and then to these planets as part of the SETI program, which is still running, as far as I'm completely aware. They, they're still sending signals out to individual stars, but they don't have to send a couple of seconds of signal, just with lots of simple information on it that says, this is not the crackling of a star. This is the prime number sequence. This is Fermat's last equation, whatever. Yeah, we're still building them now. I mean, the best one would be building one on the backside of the moon. Because the, the big problem we had over the last 20 years is we made loads of discoveries. One of the most fabulous ones was, was something to do with pulsars. And they kept on receiving the signal every day at roughly the same time. And they, and they thought, we've detected, they, they nearly said that they didn't, they were wiser than that. But, but you know what they discovered it was? No, somebody kept on switching the microwave on. <laughs> For lunch. You've got to cancel out all the air-based signals, otherwise, really, we, we drown, what we do drowns out anything coming in. It's not easy. SKA uh, SKA is a specific frequency band, but yes. Okay, the, the square kilometer array is, um, as it says, it's a load of antennae working in roughly one square kilometer, and they all detect the signal at the same time. They use this interferometer technique to differentiate the signal, and they link that with other scopes around the world. So today we have radio dish is effectively working at the diameter of the Earth. Because if you've got the Earth going around like that, you've got one dish pointing that way there, one dish on that side pointing that way, looking at the same object, the distance they are apart is 8,000 miles. And that's effectively the size of the dish we're using, even though we're only using two small dishes. So the dish gets big if you separate two dishes and connect them together with lasers. That's how we have to do it. <laughs> So yeah, we're already working at the size of the air quite comfortably. I'm not sure we've done anything with orbiting probes much yet, but that'll be one of the next jobs. That's a good question. It's like 10,000 potentially stars. Not done in any of them. So I think that's something missing. No, it's not something missing. It's something misinterpreted. Everything in that equation makes sense. If you can find those numbers, you do get the answer. It's as simple as that, or you get an answer that makes sense. Um, what, they, what they gave their numbers on well, this one here, they probably used like 50 or 100 billion. Because when they did that, that's how many stars we thought were in our galaxy. We now think there are 400 billion. So you can actually multiply their numbers <laughs> by something like four. I didn't think of that one. It's made me think now the maths. So the idea we could be talking about 40,000 planets now with their numbers. Okay. And the one thing we are now good at is these two. Well, that one very good at now. We're starting to say nearly every star has got a planet. Nearly every star has a planet. Most of them have more than one. I would say about one in 10 stars has a planet in the Goldilocks zone, and that's probably not being generous enough. About one in, now this is where I start to think it's more silly, one in a sort of a million of those planets might have an oxygen atmosphere that lets life start to force and life grow. And then it really just, it just snowballs after that for me. I can't. He's talking about binary. He's talking about binary systems, and most stars out there are part of binaries or triples or quadruple systems. But 
we're normally talking about stars orbiting each other at fairly great distances. And if you're a planet orbiting one star, chances are the other star's not having a, a great effect, but it's having some effect. So you will have a, like a seasonal effect because of going towards that star, it'll drag you out. And as you're around the back of that star, you'll be drawn into your star normally. Uh, it will have an effect, but as far as I'm concerned, because of the environmental things of life, I think life will find a way. As long as you've got water on that planet for, if you've got it all the time, great. If you've got it some of the time, I think it's enough. You only, because some of our life forms on here and have an antifreeze built in. So the bottom line is once you've got a life that, okay, it, okay, it's getting cold, it's getting cold. And if one in a billion of those life forms survives because it had a little bit of antifreeze inside it, every one of its progeny will probably have, have antifreeze inside it. Yeah, yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. We're here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If we weren't here to argue, and any of them are zero from outside the Earth's point of view, it's zero. And that's why it's very tricky. That's why I say 10,000 sounds a bit generous from the geezers who know what they're talking about. But well, the only the only things we can assert is that on that one. I think in the next 10 years, we will start to assert that one. Once we found an oxygen atmosphere somewhere, there's problems with that, but yeah, it usually means life as well. But we start to start generating more numbers. As we go along here, as time goes on, we generate more. Yes, that's very true. Well, that last bit. Bottom line is, yeah, here we are. I always say, yeah, oh, God, are we intelligent? Well, on the scale I'm talking here, we're barely there. We're on the border of intelligence that could start. We're only just starting to answer that bloody question. And look at all of these. We're nowhere near the answer because everything after that is pure conjecture because we have no suitable environments outside of the air. Well, Mars, actually, technically, I've been reading about that recently, has um, organic compounds on the surface. It's looking optimistic that we go there, we might find something was there. But I hope we do because I tell you something, once we find there was something on Mars, this all opens up. I don't think we will, but I'm hoping we do. <laughs> I'm, opt I'm, I'm optimistic, but not. Let's go. Two billion years. Two to three billion years. Most of that time. Um, because the, suit, not, the first the first plant, uh, the first life forms were carbon dioxide breathers. Uh, he's, so I'm trying to rephrase the question. No, what was the question? Um, yeah, he's talking about the, the early generation of life on Earth and what was the atmosphere? Well, it was mostly carbon dioxide. I'm talking way before that, really. The Cambrian explosion was its own thing. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that kind of stuff. But. We absorb by bloody everything. Yeah, that was a long took million years. But still, we're talking about a million years is like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm only talking in terms of millions as opposed to billions. There was a question there. Yeah, because well, you know that effect when the planet goes in front of the star? It's called micro-lensing. And what it does is the atmosphere of the star acts like a lens. And it actually directs the light towards us and carries the information of the atmosphere. Yeah. 
they would have had that information in them days, put it that way. We have that now. That's brand new information after Drake came up with 10,000. But now we've already seen an atmosphere on, on another planet. So we know it can have atmospheres. And this is a, a Goldilocks planet as well, if I remember right. So it's kind of in the right place. I don't, I think it was mostly carbon dioxide and hydrogen or something like that. Well, it wasn't oxygen because as we've just stated here, if we detect oxygen on a few other things like this one on Venus a year or two back, certain chemicals say you've got life. Oxygen is kind of one of them because as we've just stated, oxygen is grabbed by bloody everything. Okay, and if there's still oxygen there, something's producing it. Um, where are the kind of things that, you know, those green things, all stream things probably behind you are producing the oxygen. So there's got to be something producing that gas. I can't remember the name of the gas that they saw on uh, Venus last year, but they found it in the upper atmosphere and they said, we can't find an explanation for this except for life. I think they did subsequently find an explanation, but that, that's what makes us move forward. They find something that they can't explain. And then they've got to sit there in a dark room for six months to talk to each other and say, what the hell is this? And they usually come up with a solution. So at the moment, we've not detected an oxygen atmosphere. That'll be a big star day. Should be Earth celebration day if we do that one. We are not the only life here. Let's celebrate what's left of the planet before it's all gone. <laughs> Would you mind repeating the question as well for the mic and the rest of the audience? Yeah. Go. Yeah, so I'm troubled by uh, uh, FC, the uh, detectable word uh, science. He talks a lot about radio and TV. That's a tiny, tiny part of it. Yeah, I, I talk about those. So, uh, what was. Yeah, I was going to go. Uh, he's talking about the signals that we send out and the kind of signals that are detected. We won't use radio waves to communicate with another civilization. We'll probably use the hydrogen alpha wave, a very defined frequency in space because everyone, everyone is looking at it. The pictures that you saw at the beginning of this are pictures of me that I took in hydrogen alpha light. So we are always looking at that particular frequency. Now there are some that are in invisible areas and visible that's irrelevant, but we know what frequencies to look at, and we would send a carrier wave on those frequencies and hope that it's powerful enough to be detected 10, 100, or 1,000 light years away. Because it's not worth just sending out a radio wave. Wow, God, that'll, that'll look well weird. That's still a very tiny part of the electromagnetic. But that's why it's so good. Yeah, but most intelligent people will start to suggest that if you're going to listen for a signal from somebody, listen to the signal they're most likely to send as a signal, not just general noise like our radio waves. That's just general noise. TV, radio, that's that's just boring background noise. Do you, who remembers the old CRTVs with the black and white dots all over it? Some of you don't look old enough. But um, that was, that's background noise. That's coming from space. It's not from a... So you are detecting signals from space by looking at an old CRT thing, that kind of stuff. But that is not a great signal barrier. That is not the right frequency. That's basically uh, what we call 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Rubbish signal to listen to because it's coming from everywhere in the universe at all times. Okay, whereas the, whatever the 590 nanometer line for hydrogen alpha is a great one to listen to because it's a very defined frequency very, very defined frequency. Okay, it's like if you go slightly off on radio one, you can't hear it, it's far worse than that. If you go slightly off on this, it goes from a signal to nothing. It's that much of a defined frequency. There's no give and take in it at all. But that's the kind of what we do to communicate. We would pick a frequency. That makes sense. And H alpha is possibly one of the ones I've heard. I'm not a radio specialist, but that we would find a frequency to do that job with. Yes? Uh, what's your opinion of panspermia? Please remind me. I've heard the phrase, I've forgotten what it's done. Panspermia. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I can easily answer that question. If it's true that life goes from planet to planet, we know that it's probably true because we've got Mars meteorites on Earth. I'm pretty sure Mars has got Earth meteorites on Mars. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, if you have some DNA and it's in, a, in the middle of an asteroid somehow and it lands on this other planet and that shatters to a million pieces and that DNA survives, beginnings of a life form potentially. But that, that's a, yes, I, I knew the phrase once you described what it, <laughs> where it went. Um, but yeah, it's life from everywhere. Once you have life, it may well... Per we, we've gone round our galaxy... Oh, my God, I've got to work this out now. About 15 times since life was born on Earth. So we've gone in orbit around our galaxy about 15 times in that time. Right? So we do a lot of movement. So it's not just our star system that may have had the asteroid from us because we had the Umaguma one, whatever it was called, Never pronounce it. That came from another star system, traveled right through our star system, and just carry on going. So we get visitors from other star systems. This thing, the cigar shaped thing, about five or 10 years ago, whatever it was. They, they thought it was a spacecraft. <laughs> they don't understand about thermal jets. Okay, so basically, that's how stuff moves around solar systems. So if, if an early bacteria, like a good old tardigrade, decided to uh, get on one of them, it won't last long enough, but you get the idea. And it jets off to uh, Alpha Centauri. Who knows? Alpha Centauri is our closest neighbor, and that's got a planet around it in the habitable zone, a bit bigger than the Earth. But we have not detected an atmosphere yet, I don't think. So lots of stuff going on in this area. I say, we're only up to there. <laughs> so partly why I like this subject. I probably add to it every 10 years if I can live long enough. I like stick my head in the jar for those who get it. <laughs> right, um, should we call that a day or anything? We could, I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, well, um, you say Umaguma, I say Umaguma.